Hi, welcome back to Petroleum Downstream Crash Course. Today we're going to talk about delayed coking. Now, delayed coking, what is it? It is a kind of thermal cracking process. And we have discussed thermal cracking processes before if you have watched my previous videos on vis breaking. Now, just to recap, vis breaking is to reduce the viscosity of a vacuum residue or atmospheric residue via a subject subjecting it to a limited amount of heat so that uh, less, you know, gas oil or kerosene or those valuable oils are needed to dilute the vacuum residue to make it acceptable for use in ship fuel. And the main reason why you want to dilute that fuel is uh, to reduce its viscosity. Through vis, through vis breaking, uh, you can reduce the viscosity of the vacuum residue so that less of the gas oil or cutter stock as they say, cutter stock is needed to dilute the vacuum residue to make it acceptable an acceptable viscosity for use as ship fuel or bunker fuel. Now we have talked about a few kinds of vis breakers before. F firstly, it's a soaker vis breaker where you have feed and steam to pass through a heater at 410 to 450 degrees C. And then it goes into a soaker where you quench it, uh, where the, sorry, it goes into a soaker first, where the most of the cracking occurs, and the vis breaking occurs, and then you add some quench oil, or you just reduce the temperature of the oil through some quenching mechanism to stop the vis breaking reaction, and then you fractionate it. Then the other way you do it is through a coil vis breaker, which is, which is a much simpler mechanism. This is the coil vis breaker here. This is a soaker vis breaker. So in a coil vis breaker, you have a vacuum residue feed with some steam. You heat it up and uh, heat it up to a temperature of 450 to 490 degrees C, and you quickly quench it with some quench oil or something else. Then you fractionate it. I mean, the results are more or less the same. You have discussed the pros and cons of each of the vis breaking techniques before. Now, uh, the idea behind these vis breaking technologies is, of course, to reduce the viscosity of vacuum residue. But what if you want to increase the uh, yield of gas oils and other kind of valuable oils if you don't want to produce ship fuel? Uh, if you don't want to produce ship fuel, then you probably want to use something like the TGU, the Shell Thermal Gas Oil Unit, which we have discussed earlier in other videos. Um, that will still leave you with some kind of liquid fuel or liquid residue at the bottom because the thermal thermal cracking is at a you know moderate intensity so we have talked about the designs before now what if you really really want to maximize maximize your distillate uh, yield distillate yields meaning to say gas or kerosene etc etc well, there is this process known as delayed coking. Why is it called delayed coking? I'll explain to you right now. Delayed coking is basically, you know, take for example, you have a soaker vis breaker set up, except you crank up the heat to a lot higher temperature, a much higher temperature. So instead of 410 to 450, you take about 490 degrees to 495. That's about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And once you do that, uh, you charge it to a soaking drum, or in this case, you just call it a coking drum, because the idea is that you want to induce coking. So in that coking drum, the cracking reaction occurs, similar in concept to the soaker vis breaker, except this time, you don't just crack the oils in a very mild fashion, we crack, we crack it very severely in this case, because the temperature is a lot higher. And of course, after that, we kind of quench it, and then we fractionate it. But we don't want this low viscosity fuel, so we crack it all the way so that, you know, minimi we minimize the production of low viscosity, lower viscosity, you know, residues. But there's a problem, okay? There's a problem. This thing will get clogged up with coke after a while. Get clogged up with coke, and sooner or later, you have to get the coke out. And to get the coke out, you have to shut this whole plant down. Alright? So that's a problem. 
And what what has been done? What has been done is to use this setup instead. So just ignore all this here. You have just to pay attention to the feed. Now we have the vacuum residue and steam as usual. Steam. We charge it at 490. Except now that we instead of one drum, one coking drum, we have two coking drums. So let's say, let's say, you keep filling this coking drum up with coke until you cannot fill it up anymore. All right, you can't fill it up anymore. And what do you do? You have to, do you shut the plant down? No need. All you have to do is that while you decoke this drum, you divert the uh, hot effluent from the furnace, the hot effluent vacuum residue, into the other furnace. All right. Oh, not, not the other furnace. The other coking drum, so as to induce coking. And why is it called delo co delayed coking? I forgot to mention earlier. It's called delayed coking because, you know, after you charge the vacuum residue and steam into the furnace, you don't want the coke to form in the furnace. You want the coke to form in the coking drums. Similar in concept to the vis breaker, uh, soaker vis breaker idea where you want most of the thermal cracking to occur in the drums, not the furnace, so as to prevent the formation of coke in the furnace. Okay? So, uh, what they do is, uh, the coking is delayed in the sense that it doesn't coke in the furnace, it cokes over here. Okay? Because the coking, it happens after a while, after it exits from the furnace, so in that sense it's delayed. So that's why it's called delayed cooking. But you don't don't be fooled by the name, don't be, you know, too intimidated. It's just it's just that, you know, it's like a soaker fist breaker process. Except the cooking here is intentional rather than an unwanted byproduct. Okay? So okay, back back to the explanation. After you decoke this furnace, uh, this one will probably fill up and then you just switch it back. And the uh, Rest of the stuff will go into the fractionator where you have the lighter uh, distillates that come out and of course a little bit of residue. And what can you do with this residue? Just recycle it back with the feed. And that's how a delete coker works. Now of course you don't only have to have you know one furnace which you have to take three to five months to clean it out every time. You can always have a dual configuration setup so that your plant is always running, that's not an issue. Or you can have, you know, one furnace where you have two sets of tubes, where one, as one tube is getting cooked, the other tube is being utilized. So, uh, I mean, this kind of bypassing may be a little more expensive, but you know, it promises a continuous operation, which is very important for a oil refinery. Okay, so let's talk yields. So according to you know some some sources, some textbooks I read, in particular you know uh, Gary's uh, petroleum refining and economics, the typical yields for cooking are as follows. Are as follows. For gases, you have about nine to ten percent. The naphtha fraction is about ten percent as well. This LN and HN is just light and heavy naphtha. And of course you see the gas oil. The gas oil has a very large cut here. It maximizes the gas oil production similar to the TGU. Now, ex the difference is that instead of uh, you know, having coke at the bottom, I mean, instead of uh, liquid residue at the bottom, all the liquid residue is being converted, converted into coke. And this coke, you can do uh, various things with it. But I'm not going to elaborate that in this video, uh, just save that for other videos. Okay, all right. Thanks, guys. We have come to the end of our delayed cooking video. Hope you have enjoyed this and learned a bit more about the delayed cooking process. See you again. Bye.